Welcome to my series on mineral identification. I'm basically taking uh, the equivalent of the mineralogy class that I took in college years ago and condensing it down to a couple of videos that you can kind of digest more easily than say a university class would be. You know, in a university class it'd be 45 or 50 hours of your time and so you know, there's some things I've got to leave out, but I'm getting into the real nuts and bolts of it in this series. And so far we've covered an introduction to minerals and we've started on the clues that you need to pursue to be able to identify minerals. We've covered the, the first of the clues and we're going to get to the other ones in this video, which is part two. I hope you enjoy it. So come along. Let's learn how to identify minerals. So our next clue is hardness and all minerals have a certain hardness and you can test them by making a scratch or seeing if, if you can make a scratch. And what you do with that is you have a, a, a known set of minerals and then you do a scratch with that mineral and if uh, mineral number one will scratch you, you're trying to identify a mineral, right? And so you do a test on the mineral you're identifying and if quartz will scratch it, then you know it's at least as hard as quartz. Um, if quartz won't scratch it, then you know it's harder than the quartz. Um, it, and then you keep on moving up or down to figure out what it is. So this is a test kit. I'll kind of move it in here. Um, you can buy mineral test kits on Amazon. Uh, there's a number of them that range from fairly inexpensive to super expensive. Um, they have different kinds of things. But this is a range where hardness 1, hardness 2, hardness 3, hardness 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There is no diamond in there to test it was just hardness 10. But this is actually corundum, which is the mineral this is corundum, that's the mineral that uh, is uh, the rubies and sapphires are made out of, and it's hardness nine. Uh, and then topaz, quartz, felspar, apatite, fluorite, uh, calcite. Uh, anyway, there's all of these together uh, that you can use to test for hardness. And, and finding out the hardness of your mineral that you're trying to identify, finding out the hardness will tell you more information about what the mineral might be and give you a clue that will help you find out what mineral you have. Now, one thing with hardness is that you got to remember, as I talked about a few minutes ago, that weathering can change a mineral and change the hardness. If you, I keep bringing back this piece of, of iron oxide, uh, limonite, gertite, that uh, was once a piece of pyrite. If you test this, it won't test hardness for pyrite because it's weathered. So that's one of the things you need to know about testing hardness. You need to test minerals that are not weathered or changed or altered in any way. Then, because then you're testing, you know, other things about the mineral. So hardness. Okay. So number three is density. And some minerals are a lot heavier than others, just a lot more dense. This mineral is galena. It's from a mine, from a mine that produced lead, lead ore. And because of the lead the density, the density here, the density of galena is real heavy. And unfortunately, I can't show you on a video that something is heavy, but uh, it is. Now, I showed you this quartz crystal. Uh, there's a lot of minerals that are in this range, you know, pretty close to what quartz is, but there's not as many that are super heavy. And so having a high density is, tells you that it belongs to a, a certain group. And now you can, I can just heft this and say, yep, it's pretty heavy. But if you want to actually know what the density is, because there are tables of minerals, like I say that my rock and mineral book will tell you what the density of that mineral is supposed to be. You know, if you're thinking, well, this might be stibnite or some other mineral, right? Um, you can test the density and it will tell you in the book what the density of stibnite or whatever other mineral you're looking at, um, what, are, what the density is supposed to be, or galena, 
Um, now, density is figured with a water test, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that right now. The calculation of density is basically weight over volume. So it's often calculated as grams per cubic centimeter. And it's basically a weight type of thing. It's easy enough to weigh um, an object or a mineral uh, dry and see how much the weight is. But then calculating the volume is a little more difficult. Here is a picture of a piece of quartz that has gold in it. You can't actually see the gold in the picture, but it actually has quite a bit of gold in it. It's suspended in the water. The quartz isn't actually touching the bottom of the little cup. And it's being weighed in the water, submerged, but not touching the bottom. And that actually is the difference between that and the weight of the water without the specimen in it is what's used to figure the volume. Anyway, it's an important thing and it isn't always necessary to calculate the exact density out, but it's something that can be very helpful in identifying a mineral. Okay, let's talk about our next mineral identification clue, which is cleavage. Now, um, cleavage actually is one of the things that are the most useful for identifying a mineral, if a mineral has cleavage. Not every mineral does, but when it does, a lot of times that's very useful to help you uh, in identifying what the mineral is. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, this again. This is a fragment. It, you can see it's kind of a, a tilted rectangle. This is a piece of calcite, which is a mineral, and it has three separate cleavages. There's two cleavages there, two cleavages there, and one in the cleavage here. So two, a pair. So each of the pairs is one cleavage. So there's three cleavages because there's one, whoop. Because there's one, two, three separate faces of cleaving. And what it is, is basically you can take a sharp edge like a razor blade or, or a knife edge or something like that and put it on the mineral and whack it with a hammer and the mineral will break along a certain plane. That's what cleavage is. And if a mineral has, like I say, cleavage, it can identify it because the actual angle of these breaks, so like on calcite, this angle between all the different planes, yeah, that angle is always the same. So if you were to look at any calcite crystal or break it or whatever, it would always have the same angles between the faces of the cleavage. It has to do with how the atoms are arranged inside the crystal. There's points or planes of weakness, and the planes of weakness between the atoms is what makes for cleavage. Now, some of you may, um, may have seen like pictures or heard about people breaking diamonds. You know, it's a very uh, careful way where they put a knife edge and then hit it with a, a mallet. And that's what they're doing. They're cleaving diamond. That's how one of the ways that they break a diamond up if it has flaws in it or cracks, or they get it set up for cutting. Um, they don't do that with small diamonds, but with the big, super, you know, valuable ones, you know, 20 and 50 and even more carat rough pieces of diamond, they will cleave it to organize the crystal into its most useful shapes and so that they can get the most valuable stones out of it. Now sometimes there is a few minerals, the number of cleavages, you can have one, two, three, three gives you a full three-dimensional shape, but there are some minerals that have even more than that. Um, this mineral over here on this side, there's actually two minerals, one on this side that's gray and another one on this side that's brown. The brown one is a mineral called sphalerite. And sphalerite actually has six different planes of cleavage. As far as I know, it's the only mineral that has that many planes of cleavage. The other mineral on the other side breaks to square shapes and is gray. 
and uh, is heavy. And so by putting together gray, heavy, square, it's Galena. It's, it's a, a, and then, you know, I told you knowing associations will very commonly stalarite, which is a zinc ore, and galena, which is a lead ore, very commonly stalarite and galena are found together. So here you have a, a perfect example of just that knowing the association, knowing the color, knowing the cleavage, um, knowing the density, you put that all together and you've identified the minerals. And then on the back, there's a light color thing, which if you look around on this piece, you can see the cleavages on it too. White colored cleavage. And we're gonna talk about another test, which is an acid test. Um, you can put a drop of acid on this mineral and it will fizz. And that identifies it as calcite, which is the same mineral as I showed you a second ago. This also is calcite. Okay, so cleavage can be a really helpful and useful tool. And um, here's a mineral that has uh, uh, a silvery gray color, kind of like the galena, but it only has one cleavage. And it's one very easy cleavage, even to the point where when you touch the mineral like this, it feels slippery because the, 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 basically it's cleaving off little fragments of the crystal as you're rubbing it. That feels, that's why it feels slippery. And so, um, this mineral, because it only has one cleavage, so it, it can't be galena, which has uh, three cleavages that are in a cubic shape. They're all at right angles to each other. So it's not Galena. Um, it only has one cleavage and, and Galena's cleavage is not so perfect that you just rub it and it feels slippery. And actually, if you rub this on your finger enough, your finger will be darkened just like, um, just like, uh, uh, like rubbing pencil lead on it. But uh, it's not graphite either. And graphite actually can be silvery and has a single cleavage like this. But the trick is this then, this mineral has some significant density to it. And um, un unlike graphite, which is really light, graphite is what they use in pencil lead. Um, this mineral is a little heavier. It's molybdenum. It's the ore of molybdenum. It's molybdite is the mineral. Molybdenum is the metal that comes out of this ore. And it's actually used, uh, they take that uh, molybdite because it's like I say, greasy and stuff. They actually put it in greases and it, it makes it a high temperature grease that will lubricate things at a fairly high temperature. So uh, um, if you've ever seen uh, molybdenum or molybdite grease, um, that's this is what it has in it. That it's a mineral that makes it uh, a better lubricant because it, like I say, it, it cleaves so easily, it's, it's slippery. Another mineral with a single cleavage is this mineral. You can see it's kind of silvery. This mineral breaks. You can, you know, I don't want to break it any more than I have to. But even as I rub it, little, little pieces, I don't know if you can see it, but little pieces are slipping off and falling on the floor. Um, this mineral has one very perfect cleavage. And if you look at it on the edge, it looks silvery. Um, but if you turn it, this way, it looks, here's, a, here's, here's one that, that's on edge. It looks like a book. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, of little flat pieces all together, just like the edge of a book. And, and, and this kind of has that, you can see. But anyway, this mineral is mica. It has one perfect cleavage. And it is something, because this is a, an example that's silvery. There are some that are kind of golden in color. And there are people that find this, kind of golden color material and uh, um, it has a kind of a metallic sheen look to it. They don't think about the edge on view. They just say, I see yellow metallic, it must be gold. Well, it's not. And that actually mica is a very common rock forming mineral and it's not unusual that it has a golden kind of color. But if you turn it on edge and it's no longer golden, it looks like a book or something like that. Yeah, it's it's mica. And, and actually they call crystals of mica books of mica. That's a term that geologists use. They found a book of mica. And and, uh, and that's what these are. These are, these crystals are books of mica. 
Now you can use a little bit of color to help separate. Remember I said there are families of minerals? Well, like garnets, where there's a number of garnet minerals, there are a number of mica minerals. And this mica, which is silvery or light colored, um, is going to be muscovite. But here's a one that's uh, got the same mica type of structure and edge on. It looks like a book, but it has a light purple lavender kind of color. And it's found in pegmatites. And if you put light purple, lavender, mica, pegmatite, that association with pegmatites, then you put that all together and it's a mica family mineral called lepidolite as opposed to this silvery one that's called muscovite. And like I say, there's associations of minerals. This is actually a specimen, not of mica, but it's intended to be a specimen of aquamarine. This light blue color crystal is aquamarine beryl and the white next to it is feldspar. So this is a, a feldspar crystal. But they grow in big crystals like this. This is how pegmatites grow, is big crystals like this. So that's another thing about you could use cleavage together with other things, color and other appearances, to identify a mineral. Okay, we're finally going to get to uh, the mineral identification clue, color. Okay, and as I said before in this video, color is the most useless and worthless of all the clues. Um, because generally speaking, a lot of minerals come in different colors and there are lots of minerals. Well, first of all, there's minerals that come in every color of the rainbow. And then there's colors that have hundreds, if not thousands of minerals. You know, the color, dark color, black or near black. I found a black mineral. What is it? Well, it could be about one of about 500 or a thousand different minerals. And just from the color black, I have no idea which of the 500 minerals or a thousand that it might be. So um, sending me a picture of a mineral that's black, I don't know. Um, send me a picture of a mineral that's red. There's hundreds of minerals that are reddish. And so, or brownish or yellowish, you know, the, it, it's just not a very useful kind of thing. But you can put it together with other stuff, like I showed you a second ago with the lepidolite and the muscovite, mica. You could see that it was a mica by looking at the cleavage and how it's set up. And, and then you could see the color, know the association that was found in a pegmatite, and you could know that it was lepidolite mica. And lepidolite actually is an ore of lithium. You know, lithium batteries and stuff like that. Yeah, a certain amount of the lithium mined in the world comes from the mineral lepidolite. It's, it's mined out of pegmatites. Uh, there's several uh, lithium minerals that are found in pegmatites, spodumene and a few others. But uh, in any case, um, that, that you can color together with other things. You know, I mentioned garnet as a family. You can't separate garnets based on color because a lot of garnets come in various shades of red, purple, brown, you know, yellow, all kinds of things, orange, green. You know, there's green garnets. Actually, there's emerald green garnets and they're considered quite valuable. Like I say, there's some minerals that come in virtually every color of the rainbow. This is a specimen of tourmaline. It's, it's dark green. This is a specimen of tourmaline. It's a, a lighter green. This is a specimen of tourmaline. It's pink. This is a specimen of tourmaline. It's black and opaque, um, but there's tourmalines in every color. I have tourmalines that are yellow, purple, orange, brown. Um, I even have a, a specimen of tourmaline that's essentially colorless. It's super pale pink. If you put it on a piece of white paper, you can barely see that it's a slight pink. If you just hold it in your hand, you would say it was colorless. So. Minerals can come in a variety of different colors and color is probably the least helpful of all the different clues that you can get. So when you send me a picture and like I say, I don't want you to send me pictures. If you send me your pictures, I'll probably just erase them. Um, all I can really see is the color and like I say, it's the most useless of the clues. So color again, it can, can be combined with other things and you can, can look at it. But, you know, with, with just color alone, which is really pretty much all you get with a picture, it's hard to tell anything about it. 
So that's color. I, I, I wish I could tell you color was the best clue, but it's not. It's the least useful. Sometimes color is useful. Um, I will show you this. This is a kind of a dark blue color. And so if you're in an area that you know has copper minerals, so you have an association link, and you see this really dark blue, it's pretty high odds that it's azurite. This is a common uh, copper mineral. It's a copper carbonate, and it is an ore of copper. And, you know, it, it, it can... So color, in that case, because you also have an association, is, is useful for identifying a certain mineral. So our next mineral clue is luster. And again, this is a mineral uh, characteristic that's not always all that useful, though sometimes it is. Um, this is a piece of quartz, uh, just like some of the other quartz I have. Here's calcite. A lot of minerals like this are considered to have a glassy luster. And so they look more or less like a piece of glass. And that kind of luster is really not all that helpful. However, sometimes you get to things like this, like the galena that I showed you, and it has a metallic luster. And you look at it, so, ooh, it looks like the luster of a metal. And that kind of luster can be helpful in identifying. Uh, there are other lusters. Uh, there's a, what they call an adamantine luster. And so uh, minerals that often have real high refractive index uh, will be said to have a, an adamantine luster. It makes them look uh, like greasy even when they're dry. A diamond is one that uh, has this characteristic greasy kind of look even when it's dry and clean. So luster is another one. There is also a pearly luster. There's a few minerals that have a, a kind of a pearly look to them. That also can be helpful in identifying them. But uh, again, it's, it's only so many of the minerals have what they call a glassy luster that it's just not all that useful as a clue. Our next mineral clue is magnetism. This is a, a dark colored mineral. It's kind of heavy. Um, again, one of many, many minerals that are black or nearly black. Heaviness tells you something, but one thing about it the magnet sticks to it, you know that it's magnetite, which is an important ore of iron. See, the magnet sticks to it pretty good. Um, so it, not a lot of minerals are magnetic. There's only really a few, but if you do have a mineral that's magnetic, then you pretty well know what it is. There's only a few that are magnetic. It's one of the tests that can be done to differentiate between hematite, which is also a blackish, dark colored iron mineral. So it will identify a lot, and it's heavy. It'll identify a lot uh, with magnetite, but hematite is not very magnetic. You can't stick a magnet to it easily like that. So anyway, magnetite, uh, another mineral. It has a, and the, the very name magnetite goes along with the magnetism. So our last in this series of uh, identification clues that'll tell you what a, a mineral is, is the, uh, the chemical tests. Now there's certain uh, reactions, chemical reactions that you can do, some of them pretty easy, some of them a little more difficult that you can use to identify one mineral from another. Now this is just a little eyedropper that I have and this is that piece of calcite that I showed you earlier. And now I'm not gonna do this because it would actually, uh, it would be difficult for me to get it on film such that you could see it and it would make a difference. But if this were filled with uh, hydrochloric acid or some other fairly strong acid, and you put that on the calcite crystal, the, the little drop of acid on the crystal would start to bubble and fizz and, and go up, uh, basically as a carbon dioxide, that's what happens because it's a carbonate and you put acid on it, it's basically similar to what happens when you open a can of Coke or 7-Up or something like that. It fizzes. And so uh, a drop of acid on that will tell you. There are related minerals and sometimes you can differentiate between them using the chemical test uh, different ways. There's a mineral called dolomite, which is a uh, 
a similar carbonate, but a little bit less reactive. And so if you put acid on dolomite, it won't react. But if you take a pin and scratch it up and make a little powder and then put the acid on the powder, then it will fizz, the powder will fizz. So that can tell you the difference between calcite and dolomite. Um, other minerals like this, I showed you this dark blue copper mineral called azurite. It's a carbonate also, and if you put acid on it, it also will fizz. So those are a couple of easy chemical tests that you can do that help differentiate carbonate. But there are tests to uh, determine the presence of silver or the presence of copper, or other things that you can do in mineral tests that will help determine um, you know, the actual makeup of the mineral, the uh, metals or whatever that might be inside the mineral. So that's what chemical tests are used for. And ultimately, I mean, you can do an, an analytical assay on a mineral and, you know, the, the, uh, the chemist can tell you what elements are in that mineral. And then you can use that knowledge to figure out what the mineral is. But normally in, in field uh, identification, you're not gonna go through much more than, than a basic ID. Although a lot of field tests do include that little bit of acid with an eyedropper because it works, it can tell you limestone because limestone is made of calcite. So uh, sometimes some of these tests are um, included in a basic field test. Well, I hope you're enjoying my series on mineral identification. And like I say, Learning to identify different minerals is a skill that's valuable and, and well worth learning. Um, I've used my skill at understanding rocks and being able to recognize rocks and minerals all over the world. I've found gold and silver, gemstones, mostly in the US, but like I say, really also all over the planet. So it's worth learning and it's worth putting in the effort to learn all these different clues and in this segment which was part two we've covered a lot of the clues in the next segment we're going to take a look at uh, some minerals that you might want to learn about more closely and uh, some that form rocks some that are valuable uh, gold and silver platinum even we're going to get into gemstones as well so that's what we'll be looking at in part three and also putting it all together we'll be talking about taking all these clues and what you know and putting it all together so that you can identify minerals so i hope you've enjoyed part two of this series um, if you want to become a better prospector and learn more about finding uh, gold and silver and such things. I wrote a book about that and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my book right now So let me tell you a little bit more about my book um, It's called fistful of gold and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself fistful of gold and uh, You can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information pictures and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed and so the book would have cost a lot more it's for sale on Amazon and you can pick it up I'll put a link in the description below I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine it's ICMJ's prospecting and mining journal and honestly you should check that out we got stories uh, and information legal stuff everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website. And the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below. But there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments but if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask do write and and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in you know in, in responding to you uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, 
and hit the uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos and you know like it and share it if again you you see stuff that you really are excited about and I'll be coming out with lots more new videos and so we'll see you again real soon